are, wait a sec, we are rolling. Okay, so look at me now at the camera. Okay. Today is the 19th of October, 2018. We're in Brookline, Brookline Massachusetts, at the house of Susan, your, your family name? Ginsburg Snyder. Sny okay, but Susan Snyder, and Ginsburg is your maiden name. Mm -hmm. Um, and we are going to be talking about your parents. Your father's name is... Morris. Morris Ginsburg. Mm -hmm. And your mother? Peppy. Peppy? That's her real Ginsburg. name. Peppy mm -hmm. Ginsburg. And what was her maiden name? Beck. Beck. Okay. Let's start. We're going to separate it into two, and we're going to start with your mother, Peppy Beck. Beck. Where is she born? My mother is born in Czechoslovakia, in Teplitzschirn now. Teplitz? Sure now. Okay. Um, the family moved when she was a little uh, child, around four, to Berlin. Mm -hmm. um, and her last sibling was born in Berlin, so there were six children in the Beck family. In the Beck family. And what year was she born? She was born in 1915. 1915. So she's born into the Austro-Hungarian Empire, basically. 1915. And... and Czechoslovakia, where she was born, was Austro-Hungary then. It was, yeah, it only became independent, Czechoslovakia, in 1918. So she's actually born in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Okay. What kind of family does she come from? What's the background? Are they religious? Are they, uh, are they assimilated? Like, are they... Her father was a very religious Jew. Okay. Um, and he worked uh, in textiles, I believe. Mm -hmm. And her mother was... Um, homemaker to four girls and two boys. My mother was second youngest. Um, this, uh, the, yeah, and then her little brother was born in Berlin. In Berlin. And, and uh, the family moved to Berlin when she was how old? I think uh, roughly four. I'm wow. Not... Those were tough times after the First World War. Yeah. Berlin was, you know, like... My grandfather, you know, he had, had to, you know, figure out how to make a living. I think they had relatives there. I don't know much about um, that early history. Okay. Um, she usually just told me she grew up in Berlin. She grew up in Berlin. And what age did she grow up there till? Um, she left uh, Berlin in 34, uh, 33, 34, um, when she was about 19. And she was um, the daughter who was involved in sports. Her sisters were in the kitchen learning how to make challah. <laughs> and bake with her so your mom. Mo your mother was an athlete. My mother was what, an what athlete. Kind of, what kind of running, running she, track? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, she was very good at it. And she was with the, uh, the uh, Maccabi movement mm -hmm. there. Sure. And she um, had a sense that, you know, she needed to get to Palestine. She told her parents early on as a teenager that Hitler was coming um, in 33. And she was going to um, go to Palestine. And I think they were a little <laughs> shocked at that. Um, she was, in, uh, I think, invited to take a, a part of the youth group, the 12-year-olds, over. Um, and she would be the leader. And so they let her go. And she went over. And she, her first stop was uh, Deganya Aleph. Okay. So she... What uh, year is this? 1934? Yes. And so she's this young woman on a kibbutz, away from her family. And uh, she, I don't know how long she stayed on the kibbutz, um, but she made her way to Tel Aviv and eventually started working uh, for a travel agency. And it was through those connections that she was able to get her family out of Germany. Um, she was a very courageous and very brave woman. Uh, and already uh, her sister's husband had already been taken to Buchenwald. Uh, her, her father was already arrested. Um, so there were already signs of it. And she, here she is in Palestine, and she's able to get papers and uh, enabled uh, through her work to get her entire family out. Wow. Her sister, uh, Fanny, she trained to be a hairdresser so she could have a profession, and she was able... Your mother. My, no, my aunt, Fanny. Your, your aunt, Fanny's your mother? Peppy. Peppy, sorry. <laughs> they had funny names. <laughs> they're, 
<laughs> Mom said that uh, her teachers in Berlin uh, didn't like that, and so she said to my mother, those are not real names. You will be Josephine, and Fanny was going to be Francesca or something. The teacher just decided so, so, those are crazy names. So for that, her. Your mom comes to Palestine. She stays. She stays. She knew she was staying. She, she was knew like, she oh, was staying. I'll go for a few months. I'll leave this No, group. I think she was really a, a, a Zionist no, at no, heart. She knew she, was, she knew she knew she was staying. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. she knew that there was danger uh, on the horizon. And I guess... What year does she get her family out? Uh, different years. She was... Uh, her... Sister Fanny came in 35. Um, her parents came shortly after that. Uh, her sister and her husband, her sister um, Hella and her husband uh, and their baby made it out to um, Sweden and they spent the war there and then she had to help them get to Palestine after the war. So the guy that I interviewed yesterday in 1946, took 700 refugees from Sweden to Palestine in 1946 on the Heimer-Loserov boat ship. So maybe they were maybe they were on that boat. Be interesting to Be find out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I her daughter is um, lives in Jerusalem, so I will Ask her. pursue that. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so your mother's in Palestine. She's working as in a travel agency. Mm -hmm. Living in Tel Aviv. She's 20, 21. She's at, well, by this point, she's... 22. After the kibbutz, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, she took some other jobs. She... And she, 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 does she like Tel Aviv? Does she like what she's... Yeah, yeah. I think she's, like, really I into it. <laughs> uh, and she also started, um, and I'm not quite sure of this year either, but it was before the war ended, probably in the late 30s, um, uh, early 40s, my mom was working uh, um, in the illegal immigration, and she, according to my aunt's story, she was a spy, um, and she worked on the Lebanese border near Rosh Hanikra. And um, she would be taking, as a travel agent, looked like she was taking people back and forth, but she was um, smuggling papers to get Jews uh, who couldn't get into Palestine at the time. And my aunt knew nothing about her, her sister's work. And yet, years later, they would be on the streets of Tel Aviv, and people would come up and start hugging my mother and thanking her for saving their lives. And Fanny would look and say, what, what were you doing? And then, at that point, she was able to tell her. So um, she really was a very brave um, and courageous woman and worked really hard to save not only her own family, uh, which she was successful at, but to save many, many uh, Jews and get them into Palestine. Wow. Um, did she ever talk to you about this, your mother? She didn't talk about it much. Uh, and uh, my mom died really young at 61, so um, I was only 25, and I really wish <laughs> that I had more information. Um, sure. sure. Uh, what she did was write a lot of letters that um, my, that to her sister Fanny, and Fanny saved her letters. My mother saved Fanny, so um, I have a cousin who's trying to help me now by translating these German letters and German, yeah. and kind of uh, uh, get the story more fully. So my mom uh, was working, and uh, she started to work for a man who brought her to America. Um, I think his name was uh, Goldman, Nachum Goldman, and uh, to work for the Jewish Agency. In the States. In the States for a while. Do you know what year this is? 46. For, so this is after the war. After the war. So this is after the war. And, and But your mother manages to bring the family. Yep. They're they, all, they all settle in Tel Aviv? Um, no, they all settled eventually in Haifa. In Haifa, okay. Most of them. Some okay. of them. Are. You know, a lot of the German Jews settled in uh, Naharia, actually. Naharia is a German Jew city. Huh. My, yeah. you know, they, they were in Haifa, yeah, okay. and uh, that's where my Aunt Fanny and Uncle Heinz stayed for, you know, the rest of their lives, mm -hmm. right on the Carmel. On the Carmel, yeah. So uh, she came to America as a young... Uh, so she's affiliated more with Haganah. Yes. Uh, yeah. She's already mm -hmm. has done work for, for them, and uh, she comes to the States to work for the Jewish Agency, and... 
Yes, as my mother told the story, um, her boss had invited her then to come to England. And of course, my mother was excited to go anywhere. But his was more of a proposal, which went beyond work. And she said no. And so he said, well, you can't be my secretary anymore. She goes, it's fine. I'll go back to Palestine. He says, now I'll get you another job. Uh, and she stays in New York, um, w not with the intent of staying, but to you know, work a little longer. And someone said that they needed help in the uh, Haganah in the New York office. Uh, so she uh, started working for Danny Shind uh, okay. and eventually um, Devika Nameri. Um, who took over from Danny Shind. And now, is this the office on 14th Street? I don't think so. Okay, because there's an office on 14th Street where the Haganah was running its operations out of as well. I think there were a few offices. Offices. Yeah. So she's, who are these two gentlemen? Can you tell me who they are? I, uh, Danny Shind I've read about. Um, he was very active for years in Palestine in Ali Abet. Um, and... He uh, was running the New York office for them, and uh, I think he went back to Palestine in '47, which is when um, Nameri took over. Davidka, I think his name was David. And these are both Israeli guys. Yes. Yeah. The, the um, Haganah had sent to New York. Yeah. Were, Teddy Kolick was also one of them. Yeah, and my parents knew Teddy Kolick um, through my mother's work and through family. What kind of work did she do? Did she, did, she, did, she, did she... So she was. Uh, she was a secretary in those days, and uh, I'm sure she knew this guy David Makarov, the, one of the guys that I interviewed. I'm because sh yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, they all actually worked under first name basis. So she or she is in '46, um, just totally enamored with New York City. She's come from Palestine. She sees the subway and the L and these buildings, and people she's, talk funny. And she's <laughs> writing. Uh, she buys her. She she gets a little apartment, and she buys herself with like a several weeks' salary a Smith Corona typewriter, so she can write every week to her sister Fanny. They were close. They were very close, yeah. and so she's writing every week letters to her, which is the ones I tell you. And um, so she starts uh, work. After, she starts work, you know, in the Haganah, and uh, she is with her boss. And Namari. And then I think she was with, uh, still with Danny Shind at the time, okay. as she told it. I don't know okay. all the names. And uh, every day she speaks to a man named Morris on the phone. Okay. And she has no idea who any of these people are. Of course, and she's to a lot of people. They have checks going back and forth, and someone has to, she sends a guy up to Morris's office to sign checks all the time. No idea what people didn't, it's really under, undercover. And uh, she was out with her boss once, she said, and this guy walks by, she recognizes her voice, and she said, who's that? He goes, what do you mean, who's that? That's Morris, you talk to him every day. And my mother was like, oh. And uh, they, that's how they met. Uh, she took her checks up by herself, I think, after that, <laughs> to the office. And uh, they uh, started, you know, they, they really fell in love at first sight. Um, found out later my mother had been engaged to a man in New York, um, and she broke that engagement off. She actually wasn't in love with the guy, she said, but in the old days, if you were 30 and unmarried, so, you know, the guy was nice. But when she met my father, she just sort of knew he was the one. So it was the Haganah, really, that brought them together. And they were married in 48. And she stayed in America and raised two kids, wow. my brother and I. Wow. So, um, you know, her roots go back, way back to um, her, her Maccabi youth movement, her, her feelings of, of settling in, in Palestine sure. at the time. And, uh, and it was through that, you know, and her desire to, you know, work in the States that she had, that's the trail her life took. It was really pretty amazing. So she did, she saved a lot of lives and, uh, and worked really hard to, uh, and, then, and then supported her family as, as uh, we sent a lot of, of um, packages to my uh, cousins and all growing up in, in the 50s. I remember making the boxes with my mother and I think the cutest thing is that we would send them 
chocolate, like M&M's that they liked, and you know Nest Nestle's coffee or whatever. And then when um, when my husband and I were in Israel for the first time together, all he wanted was elite coffee <laughs> and chocolate. So it was sort of a reversal that you know well, is the fifties in Israel was a very very hard time. Very hard time. It, there was it's called Sena. Everything was rationed. Rationed. Everything, and this was to the to the early sixties. Yeah. So I have those memories of, you know, all those cousins now are incredibly successful and whatever, but just my mother always cared for some, for, for people. And it, mm -hmm. close, of course, her family came first. Um, there were letters that my cousin Tamara was reading me that even here in the States, on her meager salary, she made sure that her parents, who were living, I think, in uh, Givat Rambam or somewhere at the time, got uh, eight pounds sterling every month that she needed to get to them so that they would be okay because they were struggling and they were older. Um, so, Did you ever meet your grandparents? Uh, I never met my grandfather and my grandmother came to the States when I was about a year old, so I have no memory. I have pictures okay. and, uh, okay. and stories about them. Uh, but the rest of her brothers and sisters, you know, stayed in Israel, raised their kids there. And they're all over the globe today, but uh, the roots go go yes. deep. And uh, yeah, it's a very interesting, uh, a very interesting. It's actually funny because uh, my grandmother was born two years before your mom, and she was an athlete too, track, but in Detroit. In Detroit, and she was a very like. Uh, when you said that to me, I I got the image and the, the mindset of that of your mom because it's the same my, si mindset of my grandmother who was just a very independent woman, had to do things her own way. You know, it was just, and she was, she was track. She track. was a track. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Loved sports, but was just, just you know, um, when they're set on something, they're going to do it no matter. They'll find yeah. a way. If it's going to Palestine and getting the family or like, and this whole thing of, of her uh, using documents at the Lebanese border, I wonder what that story is really about. And I wish that we had More, the yeah. information because that's, you know. It was smuggling Jews in. I don't know how they did it. Yeah. Um, Tamara also said she thought also in Egypt, but I didn't hear that part of the story. Uh, and she because had. Because usually these people were, you know, the, you were recruited. Yeah. You know, and, and there's ways of being recruited. You know, there's very different ways of being recruited, and um, um, it would it would be very interesting. And also of the work that she did in in forty six, forty seven, in New York. You know, there's a lot of activity going on in New York. A lot of activity. She knew a lot of the. I mean, it was a small country, as they say. So she knew the Nachum Goldmans and the um, was it Moshe Sharet. I mean, all the people who were involved. Um, and my mother spoke, well, she spoke German as her mother tongue and Hebrew and fluent English and later French and Italian. Um, that's not a gene I inherited. Um, and she uh, was blonde and fair skinned and freckled and I think um, was someone who could move very quickly between, you know, the British and uh, uh, speak to them. And she at one point once told me that they stopped her on the border, you know, as suspicious, you know, because she We're was... In, in Lebanon? I think so. Okay. And she said to me, she just looked at the guy and goes, search me. Yeah. Like, you know, and she had stuff on her. And he went, go ahead. You know, so it was sort of a real act of courage. So, really proud of her. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. We're going to move to your father now. So you see the connection. <laughs> well, no, I, mean, you know, I just yeah. So Morris is born where and when? So Morris is born in Brooklyn, New York, in 1907. His dad, my grandfather, Matis Yahu, which they could not pronounce on Ellis Island, so he became Moses Ginsburg. Moses. From Matitiao to Moses, gotcha. The guy just couldn't yeah, spell no, it, you yeah. know? So where, where, where did, where did uh, Matitiao come from? Matitiao, who I was told, came from Minsk. Okay. And Belarus. he was childhood friends of uh, Chaim Weizmann. Okay. So they were. And my grandfather came here pretty penniless. 
what, in what year? I think it was... Your grandfather. My grandfather, I'm yeah. sorry, Moses. 1896, around then. Young man. Uh, several ships, I'm sure, to get him here. Um, started caning chairs on the Lower East Side with the nickel or so that he had in his pocket. And um, short man, about five feet one. Uh, and he worked his way up and uh, he came over he brought his wife and I th think his two daughters, I think they were born in Russia. So my two aunts and his wife, well the first wife died here in America and he married her sister. Sure, sure, I mean, yeah, that's... And they had four more children. They had four more children, huh? Uh, so it's interesting, my parents both came from a family of uh, four girls and two boys. Four girls and two boys, yeah. And they were both second to the youngest. So Morris is born on the on, in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn. Where do you know where? Uh, I don't know where he's born. They lived on uh, President Street, uh -huh. twelve ninety five President Street. I uh, went 1907? to nineteen oh seven. Nineteen oh seven, and uh, my grandfather um, got into real estate, and then he established a shipping company called the American Foreign Steamship Corporation. Grandfather. My grandfather. And he had his two sons work in the business. So your grandfather started this business? Yes. Grandfather started lots of little businesses. And I don't know how the immigrants did it in those days. You know, you come over penniless, and years later, you're just, you know, a shipping magnate, you know. Um, hard work. And, and your father goes into the business? My father and his... Now, before that, what kind of ho house does your father grow up in? Is it like a uh, religious home? Is it... Traditional? Is it anti-religious? Like, no, I think my grandfather uh, kept a kosher home, but I don't think, uh, and he was very involved in Jewish communal things, like the Brooklyn Jewish Center. So he always worked for Jewish causes, but not uh, in any sense Zionistic. Okay. Um, and none of the kids, uh, it was not a particularly religious home. I think my mother's was more. Um, but as you see, generations later, I don't have any kosher relatives. Well, you have a menorah. <laughs> no, we have <laughs> observances. <laughs> um, probably all of my Israeli um, aunts and uncles um, are not, probably maybe because of what happens in Israel, but they're not, they were not, you know, shul goers, but they all had Shabbat every, you know, they always celebrated Shabbat. Let's get back to the company. What's the name of the company again? American Foreign Steamship Corporation. Okay, what is this company? What does it do? What's uh, it, it has, it's a shipping company that has ships that take anything from fruit, and later on they built it an oil tanker. So they had, uh, they were transport cargo. And where are they based out of? They're based out of New York, downtown on Broad Street. Uh-huh. That's where the office is. That's where the office is. But the shipping, the... the the boats are all around. All around, all yeah. Around. How, how many did they? Well, they didn't, I don't, they didn't, they contracted the ships, more or less. Yeah. You yeah. know. Yeah, 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 yeah. It wasn't like they, they, they yeah. owned the, I hear you. Yeah. the tanker. So um, the American Eagle um, was the tanker that they built in Baltimore. Um, so your father gets into the business. So my father gets into the business. First they had, you know, he was working in a, in a, hosiery store and different kinds of things. But when, when Grandpa finally has this steamship business, both sons go to work for him and managing... What's your father's brother's name? Kalman. Kalman. Uh, they work in the same office, and one day someone comes from the Jewish agency, and my grandfather's out of town. And they said, well, we, we'd like to talk to you about you know, ships and the displaced persons. And my father said, well, my, my father isn't here. And he said, well, can you help us? And he goes, you got the wrong guy. I don't know anything about this. And they said, well, let us tell you about this. And as soon as they described the plight of the Jews who had no home after the war and needed to get to Palestine, my father said, I'll do anything I can. And he devoted the next year and a half of his life just to the Haganah. Um, not with his brother and not with his father. He took this on himself. They didn't know? Well, they knew, but I mean, this was my father's work, you right. know. 
um, procuring ships, finding ships, um, outfitting them, you know. Had he had already been in the business for a while? In yeah. 1946? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So he knew, so. So he was already a 40, almost a 40 year old man, um, unmarried, <laughs> very handsome. And uh, uh, so he starts working. Um, Do you know who approached him or you, you don't? I don't know. Okay. And in the books it just says someone from the Jewish agency. Haganah. Haganah, yeah. So they find this company, Haganah. They were they the realize, only Jewish owned exactly, shipping realize, company. Realize, yeah. That was the only Jewish owned shipping company at the time in America. And they figured, well, we might as well bark up the up right. tree and, and see they got do. a very willing. So they got Morris to say, "I'll do it." Right. What did he tell you about his the stuff that he did? I mean, I know that your mother passed away when you were young, but your father, you know, uh, lived longer. And that. and did did you did he did you guys ever did he ever talk about it? Was he not in a bragging way? But I I'm just trying to get information from you if there's stories that you know or of course we we do know and you will talk about the one of the, you know one of the ships that he prepared was the exodus mm -hmm. but i want to try and figure out who he like you know like that period you know of 46 47 um you know i understand that on those ships all combined that he helped get out thirty thousand people came to palestine and it's a lot that's a lot. It's a lot of lives. Did he uh, talk to you about this? Was he verbal about it or he was just... Not much. Um, I think I probably heard some stories. I heard, because then when I read the names about Captain Ash and this, that, and the other one... Okay, Captain Ash was the captain who, that guy that I interviewed yesterday, that was his captain. Captain, yeah. Um, captain Ash down in Baltimore. And my dad obviously was very friendly with these people. The, I, the, the, does the ship Aloha well, meet? The Aloha or the Alozarov? It became the Alozarov. The Alozarov. Oh, okay. That's the ship that that's went to Sweden. That's the ship. Oh, okay. And that's the ship that Arthur, the guy that I interviewed yesterday, yeah. got with Ash in Baltimore, and they sent him to Marseille. They built the whole ship there, the bunks. Then Haganah told them to go up to Sweden. And pick up these refugees, mm -hmm. and they went all the way back down to, to Tunis, then to Italy, and there, and then finally they, they the ship they rammed, rammed it it. into Haifa, like onto the, <laughs> and then the British the British arrested them, and sent him to Cyprus. And this guy I'm talking to him yesterday, I'm like, how long were you in Cyprus for? I mean, you know, and he looked at me, he was like, not long enough to get laid. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, okay, what, a week or two? He was like, ah, oh, just a few yeah. days. And then they smuggled him back to Palestine. Crazy story, but the Aloha, Aloha, Aloha was the ship, which in sea became Heimer Lozarov. Okay. Yeah. So your father probably... So, yeah, they approached them because he had uh, connections, and he was able to go and look at these ships. A lot of them were being sold for scrap. Um, and they, he was able to see if they were seaworthy, and he was able to get the engineers to come in, and then he was able to hire the people they needed to um, to refit them and get out the ammunition tank, you know, parts and put in real bathrooms. My father said, you know, he was uh, overseeing all of this. Yes. Okay. One one story said is, you know, I, and I looked at the boats and I said, you know, this is a woman's bathroom. You have to put in tampon machines. He mean, he just right down to the really knowing what the refugees were going to need um, and making the bunks and all that. So he he was there every day. Um, he traveled uh, to find these ships. He traveled to see how the the uh, all the renovations were going. Um, and uh, this was between forty six and forty seven. Now, and I heard that they could do it within a month or two. They could refit the ships. So he was going a lot between New York and Baltimore? Or Baltimore, other, I think there were several other cities he had to, to visit. And then they had to do all the work of getting, they, he did tell me they once um, created a, you know, these fake um, sort of covers. So they made shipping companies up. They made up names. Okay. And one of them was the FB Shipping Company. FB? Yeah. I think that Dad told it it was either the FB or FTB. But when I read it in a book, it said FB. What did that stand for? Well, there were a lot of different 
uh, uh, things, but Dad said it st stood for fuck the British or fuck Be um, Bevan, you know. Bevan, yeah. So, so yeah. uh, and there were stories about how that came up, but they actually made up the, the, the uh, stationary thing with the FB shipping company. Uh, there were the little stories they told about, you know, bribing some, they, they had to fly out on a Panamanian flag, and uh, the guy, uh, the British, uh, informed the Panamanians that this was going to happen, and so um, they bribed the guy with two cases of champagne to leave town for three days, and while he was out of town, the ship sailed. So they did all sorts of like little things like that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and, and also the the mafia was involved. Absolutely. That I didn't know. Yeah. Oh yeah. Who do you think raised money for these ships? It was Mickey Cohen and Meyer Lansky, and it was all, you know, like there was a strike on the docks, but the ship will go out. Don't worry. Yeah. Like stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Frank Sinatra was involved. That I didn't know. They had to hire, you know, they had to hire American crews that were working with the Palestinians uh, to be on the same ship, sure. their crew members and sure. all. Um, no, for sure. There's a lot of, that's what I'm asking. So your father is getting phone calls from your mother, work-related. All work-related. And it's all money being transferred or stuff like that, check, because basically... You know the the Jewish agency is paying paying you know from the money that they raise they're paying for all this stuff right and that's how that that's how your parents meet that's very that's very 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 interesting very interesting and um, did it ever cross your father's mind to actually go to Palestine or he he knew that what he was doing he needed he needed to be there like he understood that I think my father was just committed to doing the work that they asked him to do uh, in terms of uh, of getting these people on the ships and getting the ships there. I think he was so committed to saving these people and to getting them a homeland. Uh, and I think he had, from his father, you know, always working for Jewish causes. Mm -hmm. This one never crossed his mind till they asked him. It sure. wasn't like he would volunteer to do this, like, oh my God, there's a need, I, I have to see it. But when they came, he didn't hesitate he for didn't a second. Have, yeah. He just said, this is what I have to do, and this is what I'm going to do you know, his brother took over the rest of what they had to do with their own, you know, shipping needs, and my father did what he what he could. And then his first trip to to uh, Pal what well, was Israel by then was with my mom uh, to meet her family, which is <laughs> daunting. The American, and they made many trips after that to Israel, and they took me there for the first time in '59, when I was uh, almost eight. And um, did your father stay in the shipping business? Yes. He did? He did, until he died. So they had some real he, when, estate. When did he pass away? My dad died in 1991, in 1991. at the age of 83, mm -hmm. and he had a brain tumor. And he was treated at Mount Sinai, and a young neurologist um, took over his last few days of, of care. And he was a little bit um, insensitive to... Um, his patient, who he never really got to know. He was sort of assigned to him, and uh, he was a little inappropriate by asking my brother at the time, was my father's apartment going to be on, on the market? And things that you don't want to hear um, at the last minute when your dad is dying. And then they published an obituary, and it said in the obituary that my dad was responsible for bringing 33000 uh, refugees to Palestine, and Danny got a call from this young neurologist. Your brother. Yeah, about a, a week later, and said, I didn't know that about your father, but my father was one of the people on those ships. So the neurologist's dad was taken to Palestine on one of the ships through my father's work, and then eventually came to America where he had this guy, and uh, I think the connections like that are, are pretty astounding that, you know, it was through my father's, not just dad, I mean, he worked with, you know, tons of people uh, in the Haganah, but through the, his contribution, you know, this young doctor's father was saved, yeah. and um, I hope it was a lesson for 
the doctor to get to know people and get to know their stories because people's stories are oh for sure really who they are you for know sure, for sure and for we sure. all have a story so but uh, proud of my parents' legacy um, for both of them and how the Haganah brought them together and That's, how we have yeah. these connections um, to the state of Israel uh, and so. Dad avoided labels. He never really saw himself. My mother was a proud Zionist, and my father literally was a Zionist who never even called himself that. He was always saying, I just do what's right. I just do what I can, you know. But his heart was always with the Jewish it's people. A, it's a total, typical generation attitude. The, you know, the, the, the people who grew up in the Great Depression, you know, just that, that generation of just keep it simple. I'll, I'll do what I can do, but, yeah. you know, I don't need plaques, and I don't need, right. I don't, you know. And I think he taught us through his philanthropy. My, my grandfather was very philanthropic, as were my parents. Um, my father worked, and my image of him was always going off to UJA and Federation meetings. So his heart was always in it. And even after the establishment of the State of Israel, he worked to raise money all the time for Israel and uh, said to me, you know, you can support all the causes you, know, you want, but everybody does. But only the Jews are going to help the Jews. So we had that sort of ingrained in us in an early. So, you know, our philanthropy uh, spreads across a lot of different areas, but mainly uh, is to help. Uh, and also, you know, I know this is totally off of the topic, but you told me that now that you're going to be on the board of directors of uh, the New Israel Fund. So that's also my way of sure. supporting Israel Absolutely. in the way I think it it's needs. A very, it's a very important foundation in Israel. Uh, whether you agree or not agree, they do amazing, amazing things. Right. We want it to be a, de a liberal democracy with a shared society, religious Absol freedom Absol for everyone. Absolutely. Um, you know, Absolutely. and to live in peace with our neighbors. So, yeah, I think uh, you can't argue with their goals. <laughs> I, you can argue with a lot of I, things. I, I completely agree with you, and that's actually why I'm, I, I'm mentioning it, because it is so important. I just lost a lot of light for some reason. Um, <clears throat> it's funny, if, if your father was here right now, I'd, 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 there's a question that I'd want to ask him. And it's, a, it's not really a question, but, you know, it's a story about the Vietnamese refugees that came to Israel in the 70s, you know, the boat people, um, that um, the Vietnam War had just ended, and there were thousands of boat people in, like, Asia, like, you know, who ran away from the communists when, after the Ameri after the, the, the North Vietnamese took over the country. <clears throat> and I think it was, Begin had been in office for a week, or two weeks. Like, really, literally, he just got into office. This is in June 77, and there's three boats at, in, Haif, in uh, a lot with, like, 3,000 Vietnamese refugees. And they're asking for political asylum, and nobody's taking them in. And he took these, these, these boats in immediately, and he gave them citizenships. And he was like, this was us 30 years ago. Come on in. And these people became citizens. Not a lot of people know that story. I don't. But, it, it, you know, it rings true to me. And that's that me. generation. It doesn't matter if you're a Haganah or Etzel or Lechi or right. whatever. You know, you gotta help people. Help. And he, Begin knew that these people were good people who were running away, who were on boats for, it was already a year or two that they were on boats. And there was a community of right. Vietnamese in Israel. Most, most of them settled actually in Haifa. And, uh, and he did this. He didn't even hesitate, you know. He just took, I think, about 3,000 people in. Wow. Like, well, it, it, I was very moved last year on my trip to Israel um, with the uh, plight of the asylum seekers. And how can we, you know, turn away people who are fleeing for their lives and, you know, then send them back to be killed? Uh, it, we've had too many of those stories of our, our, our own. 
Um, and this was around Pesach last year. Mm -hmm. And so it really, it rings true that, you know, you, you help people. I mean, you can't help everyone in the world, but, you know, if someone's on your shore and they, they're fighting for their lives, um, which is just so important. Yeah. So Vietnamese, Eritreans, you know, it, it, there are people there that you, you save. So, and, um, you know, I, I'm just honored that my parents were able to be a part of the Haganah and save uh, lives before, during, and after the war. Sure. Um, and my brother took on, um, his uh, contribution was to serve in the IDF. Yeah, and he was, in, yeah, he was told me. Um, but he came, he cut his, he was able to cut his tour short because my mother was sick and uh, she had cancer, so uh, he didn't stay. Right. Um, and uh, then he turned his efforts to fighting anti-Semitism through becoming a leader in uh, the Anti-Defamation League. Okay. He was one of the young leaders there. Okay. And your brother's name? Danny. Danny. One thing I did want to ask you, was your father in the, in the war, in the army? No, he was, no. He was in the reserves or whatever they were at, at the time. Which is good because then he got to. Uh, need a home front. Come on. No, know. but he's able to help. Uh, <laughs> no, no, for sure. It's just something that I forgot to ask. I just yeah. wanted to ask if he was if he was in the Second World War. Susan, I think we're good. Is there anything else that you would want to tell me about about your parents that we didn't talk about that may, you think is important or just take your time just before we end? I just want to make sure that you feel good with what you talked about. And if there's no, something that we didn't leave out. I think, you know, as I said to you earlier, like my regret is that they didn't talk about it that much with me because they had many more stories. Um, but from what I've gathered from my, you know, my family and the things I've read about them, um, I think that they, they both, in their own humble way, um, as you said, without any, wanting any recognition, um, taught me through their actions just to do the right thing, just to be there um, to say yes, to stand up for uh, when you're needed, when you're asked to do something for your people and your family. Uh, family first was, you know, both of their mottos. I mean, they did nothing they wouldn't do for their family, and especially for um, even Danny and I came first. We knew that. Um, but just to sort of stand up for when you're needed, and to um, you know, make a commitment to the Jewish people anywhere in the world, uh, and do what you can, and they both did that, and uh, in very different ways. Um, they had very different personalities. My mother was the more stronger, outspoken uh, person. My father was the quieter, um, more reserved, sensitive person. Um, and yet, the combination. I, I feel like I'm blessed to have both of the, that gene pool in me and uh, to hopefully, you know, somewhere along the line make my contribution the, sure. way, what, the way they did, help maybe through um, supporting the NIF and uh, just working for the causes that I believe in, both in my country and in Israel, which sure. is really important to me. But um, they certainly had played a role in, in Israel in the beginning of the state of Israel, and for that I'm indebted and incredibly proud. Perfect timing. Okay, I think, I think we're good. I'm All right. Take that picture of that plaque. Okay. I'll and if there's another picture of your parents that you can find for me, okay. that'd be great. And I am going to. That wasn't.